I wouldn't have done well somewhere like South America or Africa. My personality seemed to be agreeable only when I was out of the sun. Welcome to Keep It Fictional, a weekly podcast for book lovers by book lovers. Build your to-be-read list with Sadie, Liz, Virginia, Fiona, and Corrine from the Port Moody Public Library. Warning, this podcast contains strong opinions and may cause an increase in your library holds list. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keep It Fictional, a podcast for book lovers by book lovers presented by the Port Moody Public Library. You may or may not remember me, but my name is Liz. I'm kind of a ringer now here at KIF, and it's a pleasure to be invited back to participate in this lovely podcast. And today we have with us Sadie and Virginia. Hello. Thank you for joining me. Now, we've got a smaller crew for you today because we are recording this, can I say this, at the end of 2023. So we're doing a little time travel by the time you're listening to this, but hopefully you will enjoy today's book recommendations, which are themed free play. Basically, we're doing whatever we want today because, again, it's just before the holidays at the end of 2023. Now, it's a bit of a surprise for me as to what everybody has chosen today. So why don't we just jump right into it? Sadie, would you like to talk about your book? I can do that. All right. So the book today, I actually, you know, I don't think there is a topic where I don't say I struggled to find a book for this topic. And I mean, I'm going to say that with a free play. I'm even going to say that with a free play. And the book that I decided to talk about today is one that I had actually planned on talking about a few months ago for our underappreciated reads topic. And then I ended up not there on that day. And so I didn't end up talking about it. So I figured I would bring it back. And I was telling Liz about this book this morning and a kind of about the one of the real reasons why I wanted to bring this book onto the podcast. And I will tell everyone the reason is because it's actually written by a friend of mine, a very, very good friend of mine, uh, basically a sister. And he wrote this book, ooh, probably close to 15 years ago now, but it is still um, available through Interlibrary Loan. We don't have it in our catalog, but you can get it through Interlibrary Loan. And yeah, so I just wanted to give her a little bit of a shout out um, as well as highlight her book a little bit. So the book that I will be talking about is called The Modern World, and it's by Cassie or Cass Beecham. And it is a book of short stories, which is not generally, I see Virginia giving me an odd look. It is not usually the kind of book that I read. It is also a book about short, of short stories about just kind of everyday random things, which again, is not usually the kind of book that I read. There are definitely some stories in this book that I can relate to, as well as stories that when I first read it almost 15 years ago, that actually really, really stuck with me. There's one story in particular that I, I couldn't remember all of the stories in the book when I went back to reread them. But this one story just really, really stuck out to me. And so there's definitely things in this book that kind of drew me in and I think that could potentially draw other people in as well. So the way that the stories are described by Cass herself, they all revolve around women. They revolve around women of intelligence, women who try to make sense of their lives but often fail to do so, women whose lives are compromised by self-doubt and poor judgment, Women who, in other words, are slipping through the cracks. And so each of these stories is told in the first person by a different narrator. Um, there's no kind of through story uh, between all of them. And they are all told by young women, usually between kind of the ages of, I would say, 19 and 30 in that decade. As it says, they're women who are struggling a little bit. Their lives might not be exactly what they envisioned them to be. And each of the stories just gives you a little bit of a taste of what their lives are and kind of what their struggles are. I would say that this book is definitely more character driven than plot driven, which again is not my kind of book. But the one story that I am going to kind of explain a little bit um, is the one that has stuck with me the longest. And it's actually probably one of the hardest ones to read in the book. It's one of the saddest stories in the book. 
And it actually takes place in my hometown of Nelson. And it revolves around a young girl who has moved away to Toronto, is kind of happy to finally be out of the small town life and kind of envisions herself now as a big city person. And she's back in a small town for the holidays and it's really, really snowy. And she's kind of trying to figure out if she fits here anymore. And so she follows her mom. They go down to the co-op to get some food. And she decides that she's going to walk home up the huge, huge snowy hill. And if anyone is familiar with Nelson, the hills are about like that. And so in the winter, even if you don't have the right of way, if you're going downhill, you have the right of way because you can't stop your car sometimes when it's snowy. So the young woman decides that she's going to walk up these huge steep hills to get back home. And on her way home, she passes by one of the elementary schools. And this school happens to have a big field and it's a big field and it also has hills around the field. And there's a car that has crashed down the side of this field. And there's two girls, probably 13, 15 years old, who are sitting on the side of the field. And as this young woman um, approaches them, they're not talking, they look in shock. They don't look injured, but but they also don't look like they're doing very good. And as she gets closer, she realizes um, that there's two more people in the car. Uh, one is an older woman, and the older woman is clutching a young man, a teenage boy, to her chest. And as the young woman approaches, she realizes that the boy is dead. And so the story kind of continues on as this young woman goes to get help. She goes to call for the call the police. And then she sits with the girls. And that's sort of the the extent of the story. There's there's not, as I said, there's not a lot that sort of happens in these stories. Um, it's just kind of these brief little kind of slices, brief little moments in these women's lives. And you kind of see kind of these the emotions more more than the actual stories. So yeah, that one is called uh, Visit. And that's kind of the one that stuck with me the most as I read it back originally. And, and even today, um, it's just kind of always, always been with me. Another one that uh, I thought I would read this line, because I feel like, Virginia, you will relate to this as well. This is one that takes place in Ireland. And it's about a young woman who has moved from Canada to Ireland. And she says, I wouldn't have done well somewhere like South America or Africa. My personality seemed to be agreeable only when I was out of the sun. So I liked that line. <laughs> I definitely relate to, uh, to that line. So I think there's a lot of humorous moments in the book, but there's also kind of a lot of moments where the reader can kind of think a lot about what's happening to these women and what has kind of led them to to make the choices that they had to make and be in the places that they had to be. The writing is very raw at times. She doesn't really hold back from, from a lot of things. So some things might be a bit difficult to read in that sense. But yeah, I think that especially in a short story book, there's often something that that will kind of appeal to a lot of different people. Um, and so I think that this one is is no different. Uh, so yeah, so if you are interested in short stories, if you're interested in Canadian-based short stories, this one has a lot of CanCon in it and something that shows the side of life of some, some women that you might not see, then I would highly recommend The Modern World by Cass Beecham. Thank you, Sadie. That that sounds like a really interesting book. And the, the angle about it being based in BC is particularly intriguing. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. All right. I know Virginia has worked hard to prepare something for us today. At least that's what she's told me. So why don't you share your book with us today, Virginia? I sure did, Liz, just for you. So why did I choose this book today? I think same as Sadie, like it's totally true. Free play doesn't mean it's easy. In fact, it's probably harder. So I try to limit my choice today to books that I have bought in the last couple of months so that I can lessen my guilt of just keep buying books and not reading them. And Liz actually kind of helped me pick this book because I bought a book recently that is translated by Jay Rubin. And I thought this would be perfect for today because if you are a Murakami fan like Liz, you will recognize the name Jay Rubin being the translator of many of Murakami's works. And this book is not only translated by Rubin, but it also features an introduction by Murakami himself. So I thought it was a good choice for a book chat today with Liz being here. I also took advantage of the fact that Corinne is not here because other than the description on the back of the book, the only other thing I knew about the book is that there 
are bad bugs. Now, not that Sadie and Liz would like to hear about bad bugs, but Corinne definitely would not. So I thought it would be the day to do it. So yeah, the book is The Minor, and this is by Najume Soseki, and it's translated by Jay Rubin with an introduction by Murakami. The story is about an unnamed narrator who has been walking away from Tokyo for a couple of days. Away from the city that he has lived in, away from his family, away from his friends. And we'll later find out why he's walking away. But he's done. He's looking for a place without people. With no destination in mind, he just started walking and walking. And then he came upon a tea shop. And when he looked in, he saw that there was a man there. And the man also happened to look up. And this man was just staring at him, at every single part of our narrator with such intensity that our narrator feels like he's under scrutiny and he feels a little unsettled and he he walked away immediately. He just couldn't stand the stare of this man. And he got a little angry because like, who is this man to judge me like that? But he didn't go very far when he heard a voice calling him, hey kid. And before he knew it, his feet has turned his body around and he has started walking back to the tea shop. This shocked him a little bit because he's supposed to be walking away from people. But here he is, just one call, just one line, and he's heading back. And he felt a little ashamed of himself for this lack of conviction. He's shocked at how conditioned he has been to respond to another human being. When he came back to the man, the man asked him, Hey, kid, do you want a job? It's going to make you lots of money. Just tell me you're going to take it. I'm going to give you more information about it. Just say you'll take this job. Now, money and jobs are kind of far from our narrator's mind at this point. He's not really concerned about it, even though he really should, because he kind of left his house without really thinking about what he may need. He's 19 years old. He's quite inexperienced. He's never has a job before. He can't even really run away properly. He has no, he didn't bring any clothes. He has practically no money on him. He has no idea what he's doing, but yet he wasn't really thinking about money. He wasn't thinking about jobs. But again, just because he's so conditioned to respond to like another human being, he said, okay. He said, okay, to the man that he would take the job. The man told him that, oh, okay, great. I'm going to take you to the mines nearby and you are going to become a miner and you're going to make so much money. Our narrator thought being a miner is probably one of the lowest job you could get. He can't think of anything else worse than that. But when he thought some more about it, he thought, well, maybe this makes sense because I was kind of looking for something to go into the dark, to go where there's no people. And yeah, I guess in a mind that kind of fits, it's dark, there's not a lot of people there. Maybe getting a job as a miner is just what I need. Well, it is not because he's absolutely not prepared for what is to come, including the aforementioned bed bugs and more. Natsumi Sosaki is one of the most revered and respected writers from the Meiji period in Japan. He's like a master that kind of helps define Japanese literature and his face even appeared on Japanese money for decades. And this book, The Minor, is his least well-known and probably his least like book. People just don't know what to do with this odd little book and it doesn't fit alongside all his masterful works like Kokoro and I'm a Cat and Botjang and many others. And I was told that this is quite different in tone and in style. It also doesn't help that many people consider the minor not a story, not a novel. Like many of them say it's experimental. And the ending is infuriating for so many readers. They read it like, why did I just spend time reading this? And many of them consider this to be very, very unsatisfactory, to put it mildly. However... I think this is a really good entry point for me for this offer. Not just because I like being contrary, because I didn't really know about the reputation of the book prior to starting this, but I was drawn in like right away. You know, oh no, I judge a book by the first like 10, 15 pages, but I just really love the ruminations of the narrator. Throughout the book, it's just basically this narrator observing 
his own behavior, his own reactions to sort of what's going on around him. And you get into his mind right away with this running commentary of his. He's like examining his own shortcomings. He's looking at his own inconsistency as a human being. And there's like a lot of lines there. I'm like, oh yeah, that's so true. And like I've always posted it in there just so that I can collect all these lines later. And I love this like kind of tongue-in-cheek author slash narrator comments about like how this, this can never be a novel. In a novel, you expect a character to develop, you expect the plot to develop, but I'm just stating the facts here. I'm just writing it down as it is and and how he sort of compares between reality and sort of what exists in the story and how humans in real life, they, they're not going to behave the way like they behave in stories that it follows this pattern. And so for me, it actually works really, really well. I really enjoy just reading about his thoughts and his observations about himself and also like the people that he meets in the minds and and what's happening to him. It's weird because I also realized that maybe I should look for books with bugs as the first book for New to Me offers because it works for Soseki and it also works for Liz Factor, as you know. So like, despite how scared I am of bugs, maybe that's what I need. It's just like, find a book with bugs and then that will work. This book is not for anyone, as you can probably imagine. Not for anyone, not just with your bad bugs business, but also not for anyone that has like claustrophobia um, or anything like that because the minds in here are quite something. Just the way he described what happened and like how just never ending the mind is and you just go deeper and deeper and the tunnels and all the passageways just get smaller and smaller. It is not definitely not for the faint of heart. But I really, really enjoyed this book which is probably something that no one else in the world would say. But... At least one person agrees with me and that person is Haruki Murakami. So I, I feel pretty good about that. In fact, he said in his introduction that this is actually one of his favorite book. He also, I think, mentioned the minor in his book, Kafka on the Shore, which kind of prompted Jay Rubin to translate this book. As he said in the introduction, it is one of my favorites, I confess. And I suspect that there may even be other readers out there, not many to be sure, who, like me, are far more strongly drawn to the minor than to such supposedly representative late works such as Kokoro or Light and Dark. So I feel a little bit special that someone else also agree, and it's Murakami. So anyway, I think I'm probably going to go check out his other books just to see what they are like. Mark was saying how like, oh yeah, this this other book is like the most like this one. And so he suggests that I should go check that out. But I, I think I'm going to try some of his like so-called representative works because I think that would be interesting to see kind of what everybody else likes about Soseki rather than like, you know, Murakami and me. So um, anyway, so this is The Minor by Natsume Soseki and it is translated by Jay Rubin and did it just for you, Liz. Just for you. I really appreciate that. I'm sure Haruki Murakami appreciates that. And your TBR, your bookshelf, really appreciates that as well. So good on you to go grab something that you have had sitting there waiting for you. Well, I think this is a great segue to today's existential question. You'll find out why in a moment. Um, So in conversation with Virginia, we were just talking books as we usually do. And I had a confession. I had a confession that one of my purported favorite authors, which I have proclaimed on Keep It Fictional, is not necessarily a favorite in the traditional sense. So my question to everybody on the panel today is, are there any authors that you would put on your favorites list or say that you particularly like, but it's not entirely or necessarily about their books or their writing? Maybe it's about their aesthetic. What do you think, Virginia? Well, I I had a hard time with this question because I'm just like, I don't really know. but. Weirdly, this book at the back, there is a blurb from someone else. And I stared at that name like, oh, that person, that person is the one. Because really, I've only read one of this person's book, which is Slade House, which I was going to talk about on like the, what was that? The the authors who write in different genre episode that I wasn't here for. That was the book I was going to do. But that's the only book that I've ever read. I'd actually reread that book for the episode, but wasn't here. But yeah, David Mitchell. David Mitchell is the author that I um, think I like. 
And I think I like because every time I see books that are like, oh, this is like, you know, for fans of David Mitchell or like give David Mitchell blurb the book. I'm like, oh, OK, I think I think I'm going to like this because just the way I imagine his books to be like very like it always it always has all these multiple storylines. Everything's sort of like are all very weird and, and it's sort of eventually kind of tied together. It always spans like centuries after centuries, you know, like and so and same with Slate House. And of course, Gabriel talk about the Cloud Atlas or attempt to talk about it. It was like 15 minutes later, they were still telling us about more things that happened because there were so many things that happened in that book. You should go listen to that. But anyway, so yeah, so like I, I always feel like that would be an offer that I I like. And I know that like anytime, like I said, if it's a book that has his name on like the front or like if it mentioned that it's for people who like them, I always end up liking those books. So I feel like that would be the offer like, in terms of the aesthetic that probably is the person just like very strange very like it's not straightforward it's always like it jumps back and forth in time jumps back and forth in places I feel like that's the type of book that I I do like so I'm gonna say David Mitchell one day I'm gonna read another book by him but like for now so one day you may become an actual fan of Mitchell's body of work but for now aesthetically very pleasing to you (laughs) okay that's totally fair yeah um now, I have an author that I read, I think, a substantial amount, like enough to to know whether I like this person's writing, their general style, and that's Haruki Murakami. And yeah, I, I admitted to reading, I was like, I have to tell you something. I like, I like him as an author, but I don't necessarily like everything he writes, and I don't jump to read everything that he writes. It doesn't necessarily appeal to me. Now, I have enjoyed a lot of his books. Would I call him a favorite author? I'd say yes in a way because I do like his aesthetic. I like how uh, he puts a lot of himself into his work. If you know a bit about him as a person, he really enjoys music, particularly jazz. He's compiled a lot of jazz playlists for uh, local Japanese radio. He loves cats. There's always a cat in the book somewhere, even though the book is never about cats per se. He enjoys cooking, and there's always some element. Somebody's cooking something. He's describing the food. It's just very atmospheric, very down-to-earth kind of elements that he throws into his magical realism style of books. So, you know, food and music and cats. I How can I not like this person? So for me, it's it's a bit of both. It's some of the writing and then a whole lot of the aesthetic. So yes, my confession. Uh, How about you, Sadie? I know you were mulling this one over. And does any author fit into that category for you? No. So I I was telling Liz before before we started recording that I I, I needed to go last with the existential question so I could hear both of your answers and see if anything like came to mind as you were talking. But you know, I I don't know if there is like I kind of think about aesthetic and I think about kind of the the creation of that aesthetic in books and and I, I I just can't think of anything that sort of I I read purely based on that the only the only author that came to mind was one that I actually talked about for our guilty pleasures episode just CJ Archer who writes a lot of like historical fantasy mystery kind of stuff and it's just kind of that the setting of that world that she creates maybe is something um, that I that I just like kind of like to like to sit in and like to be in. Um, So that was kind of the only thing that I could sort of think of that might match that. Her books aren't amazing. They're not top class kind of writing. (laughs) They're usually, I think she puts about five of them out a year. Um, And so they're really quick reads. They're, They're the books that I used to read when I couldn't, that I kind of didn't have anything else to read. I would, I would read one of those in a couple days and it just kind of put me into that place. So maybe uh, CJ Archer is kind of be the one that I that I could think of, but uh, but nothing else came to mind for this one. I'm sorry. No, that's that's totally okay. As with all existential questions, we're usually pushed into trying to make a tough choice, but sometimes there is no right answer. And it's very, very personal and very reader based. So thank you, Sadie, for that. Well, I think it's time for me to talk about my book. And today I decided to go for a comfort read. Again, this episode is being recorded at the end of the year, and I wanted something not necessarily very light, but something uh, with feel-good elements, something that I was personally interested in and wanting to 
invest what little time I have right now. So today I'm sharing with you, I'm going to fully admit I'm not finished this, but I'm loving it so far. This one is Making It So by Sir Patrick Stewart. And I am listening to the audiobook version, which is about 19 hours. So I'm 57% through. That's 10 hours and 40 minutes, and I have another eight hours to go. However, I think with that 10 hours and 40 minutes, I have a pretty good idea of the payoff with this book and that I can fully recommend it based on that. Now, the audiobook is read by Sir Patrick Stewart, who, if you're not familiar with him, he's he's a British actor who has such a beautiful, melodious voice. He's done a lot of TV commercials in addition to his stage and screen work. So it's just a very pleasant listen. Even if you're not listening to all the words, paying total attention, uh, it just sounds lovely. Now, you might be wondering, Liz, why why should I pick up this book? I'm not a particular Patrick Stewart fan, baby. Well, there are very... A variety of elements that you may find interesting, even if you're not specifically a fan of this actor. Perhaps you want to know what growing up in England was like. He was born five years before the end of World War II. Perhaps you are a fan of theater of the stage, specifically productions of Shakespeare and what the Royal Shakespeare Company was like. Perhaps you are on some level a Trekkie and indeed a Patrick Stewart fan with a particular fondness for the next generation. Or maybe you just love learning behind-the-scenes tidbits about famous people. Now, the impression that I had about Patrick Stewart, the person uh, entirely lines up with the persona that he is projecting with his book. I've always had the impression that, you know, he's not only a very dignified and refined man, as you might expect from, you know, stereotyping an accent, But you've also seen his humorous side, perhaps, and his friendships with different actors like Sir Ian McKellen and just enjoying life and being accepting of all kinds of people. He's definitely genuine. He's self-effacing, making fun of himself at his foibles along the way as he's tried to break into acting. He's sensitive and he's self-aware. He talks about instances in which he's made different acting choices about different characters that he's played and how, in hindsight, these choices perhaps were stereotypes that were negative and harmful to particular people. And he's fully owned up to that, not brushing it off to saying, well, that was just the way things were at that time. He does fully own up and regret such choices. The way he speaks about his mother to this very day, this man is 80, in his 80s. I haven't gotten to the end of the book yet, so there you go. But he's in his 80s, and the way he still speaks about his mother with such compassion and while recounting stories about the abuse that his mother suffered at the hands of his father, just the emotion, the raw emotion in his voice, you could tell that it still affects him deeply to this day and explains why he is a advocate campaigning to prevent domestic abuse. And then he's also casually name-dropping famous actors. And you can sense that the awe that he felt as a young up-and-coming actor is still something that he marvels at to this very day as somebody who's been knighted. Uh, He's OBE, Order of the British Empire. He's got Sir in his name. Uh, And yet he still talks with such reverence about the actors that he got to meet while becoming up-and-coming For example, getting to work with Vivian Lee and getting to drive Sir Paul McCartney's car. He casually mentioned one day with his castmates of a play that he really liked Aston Martins. Really, really liked them. Well, one of his castmates happened to be dating Paul McCartney at the time. And one day, Paul comes up after rehearsal. Hey, Patrick, as if he knew him. Hey, Patrick, I heard you really like Aston Martins. Here. Tosses him the keys, and he says, why don't you drive us out to the next town over? I've never been there. Let's take a ride. And just the way he talks about that and and seems so grateful to this day and says, oh, and then we met again by chance X number of years later, and he remembered my name as if that was such 
a touching moment for him. You could tell that there's just a sincerity that really reflects his his upbringing. He didn't have a lot when he was a child. And you can tell he's just been so grateful for everything that he has received. And, you know, rightfully so, working so hard after so many years. I find it hard to separate the person from the role. I I really like supporting actors who have a benevolent side or a humble side or just seem like really nice people. And I'm very pleasantly happy to say that the person that I assumed Patrick Stewart to be seems to be the person uh, that he actually is. So I'm happy to support that. Loving his voice, although it's really causing poor sleep for me because I'm trying to listen to this audiobook while I'm in bed, winding down for the day. And then I find that I have drifted off. And then I wake up with a start and then I go, oh, the audiobook is still running. Where? Where was I? I'm rewinding, rewinding, rewinding. Okay, there I was. That's what I remember. And then I do that over again. Rewind. Do that again. Rewind until I say, okay, I think it's time to go to bed. But uh, kudos to Sir Patrick Stewart for that lovely, lovely voice. So if you want something that's interesting on many levels, that is insightful in terms of various aspects of English life or theater celebrity life, something that's just pleasant to listen to, I really do recommend Making It So by Patrick Stewart. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today here at KIF Keep It Fictional. Thank you, Sadie. Thank you, Virginia. Lovely to be back. And I hope everyone has a pleasant reading journey this year. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please tell a fellow book lover about it. You can find a list of all the books we discussed in our show notes. Join us next week for another fun book chat. Until then, keep it fictional. Mm